the maidens by alex michaelides chapter 5 mariana reached for the remote control she switched on the old battered portable tv sitting upon the microwave one of sebastian's sacred positions bought when he was still a student used for watching cricket and rugby while he pretended to help mariana prepare weekend meals it was rather temperamental and it flickered for a moment before coming to life Mariana turned on the BBC news channel. A middle-aged male journalist was delivering a report. He was standing outside. It was getting dark and hard to see exactly where. A field perhaps or a meadow. He was speaking directly to camera. And it was found in Cambridge in the nature reserve known as Paradise. I'm here with the man who made the discovery. Can you tell me what happened? The question was addressed to someone off camera. and the camera swung around to a short nervous red-faced man in his mid 60s he blinked in the light looking dazzled he spoke hesitantly it was a few hours ago i always take the dog out at 4 so it must have been about then maybe quarter past 20 past i take him down by the river along the path we were walking through the paradise and he stumbled for a moment and didn't complete the sentence he tried again It was a dog. He disappeared in the tall grass by the marsh. He wouldn't come when I called. I thought he had found a bird or a fox or something. So I went to have a look. I walked through the trees to the edge of the marsh by the water and there there it was. A strange look came into the man's eyes. A look Mariana recognized all too well. He had seen something horrible she thought. I don't want to hear. I don't want to know what it is. The man went on. relentlessly faster now as if he needed to expel it it was a girl she couldn't have been more than 20 she had long red hair at least i think it was red there was blood everywhere so much of it he trailed off and the journalist prompted him she was dead that's right the man nodded she had been stabbed many times and her face god it was horrible her eyes Her eyes were open, staring, staring. He broke off, and tears filled his eyes. He's in shock, thought Mariana. They shouldn't be interviewing him. Someone should stop this. Sure enough, at that moment, perhaps recognizing it had gone too far, the journalist cut short the interview, and the camera panned back to him. Breaking news here in Cambridge. Police are investigating the discovery of a body. The victim of a frenzied knife attack is believed to be a young woman in her early 20s. Mariana turned off the television. She stared at it for a second, stunned, unable to move. Then she remembered the phone in her hand. She held it up to her ear. "Zoe, are you still there?" "I I think it's Tara." "What?" Tara was a close friend of Zoe's. They were in the same year at St Christopher's College at Cambridge University. Mariana hesitated, trying not to sound anxious. Why do you say that? It sounds like Tara and no one's seen her not since yesterday. I keep asking everyone and I I'm so scared I don't know what to slow down. When was the last time you saw Tara? Last night. Zoe paused. And Mariana she She was being so weird and I What do you mean weird? She said things, crazy things. What do you mean crazy? There was a pause and Zoe replied in a whisper. I can't get it into now, but will you come? Of course I will. But Zoe, listen. Have you spoken to the college? You must tell them. Tell the dean. I don't know what to say. Tell them what you just said to me that you're worried about her. They will contact the police and Tara's parents. Her parents? But what if I am wrong? I'm sure you are wrong, Mariana said, sounding a lot more confident than she felt. I'm sure Tara's fine, but we need to make sure. You understand that, don't you? Do you want me to call them for you? No. No, it's okay. I'll do it. Good. Then go to bed, okay? I'll be there first thing in the morning. Thanks, Mariana. I love you. I love you too. Mariana entered the call. The white wine she had poured was sitting on the con- counter, untouched. She picked it up and drained it in one go. Her hand was trembling as she reached for the bottle and poured herself another glass. 
Chapter 6 Mariana went upstairs and began packing a small bag in case she had to stay a night or two in Cambridge. She tried not to let her thoughts run away with her, but it was difficult. She was feeling incredibly anxious. Somewhere out there was a man. Presumably, it was a man, given the extreme violence of the attack, who was dangerously ill and had horrifically murdered a young woman. A young woman who possibly lived a few feet away from where her beloved Zoe slept. The possibility the victim might have been Zoe instead was a thought Mariana tried to ignore, but couldn't entirely repress. She was feeling sick with a kind of fear she had only felt once before in her life. The day Sebastian died. A feeling of impotence, a powerlessness, a horrible inability to protect those you love. She glanced at her right hand. She couldn't stop it trembling. She clenched it into a fist and squeezed it tight. She would not do this. She would not fall apart. Not now. She would stay calm. She would focus. Zoe needed her. That was all that mattered. If only Sebastian were here, he would know what to do. He wouldn't deliberate, procrastinate, pack an overnight bag. He would have grabbed his keys and run out the door the second he got off the phone with Zoe. That's what Sebastian would have done. Why hadn't she? Because you're a coward, she thought. That was the truth. If only she had some of Sebastian's strength, some of his courage. Come on, love, she could hear him saying. Give me your hand and we'll face the bastard together. Mariana climbed into bed and lay there, thinking, drifting to sleep. For the first time in over a year, her last thoughts as she lost consciousness were not about her late husband. Instead, she found herself thinking about another man, a shadowy figure with a knife who had wreaked such horror upon that poor girl. Mariana's mind meditated on him as her eyelids fluttered and closed. She wondered about this man. She wondered what he was doing right now, where he was, and what he was thinking. Chapter 7 7th October Once you kill another human being, there is no going back. I see that now. I see I have become altogether a different person. It's a bit like being reborn, I suppose. But no ordinary birth. It's a metamorphosis. What emerges from the ashes is not a phoenix, but an uglier creature. Deformed, incapable of flight, a predator using its clothes to cut and rip. I feel in control now, writing this. At this moment in time, I am calm and sane. But there is more than one of me. It's only a matter of time before the other me rises, bloodthirsty, mad and seeking revenge. And he won't rest until he finds it. I am two people in one mind. Part of me keeps my secrets. He alone knows the truth. But he's kept prisoner, locked up, sedated, denied a voice. He finds an outlet only when his jailer is momentarily distracted. When I am drunk or falling asleep, he tries to speak. But it's not easy. Communication comes in fits and starts. A coded escape plan from a prisoner of war camp. The moment he gets too close, a guard scrambles the message. A wall comes up. A blindness fills my mind. The memory I was striving for evaporates. I will persevere. I must. Somehow, I will find my way through the smoke and darkness and contact him. The sane part of me. The part that doesn't want to hurt people. There is much he can tell me. Much I need to know. How and why I ended up like this. So removed from who I wanted to be. So full of hate and anger. So twisted inside. Or am I lying to myself? Was I always this way and didn't want to admit it? No, I won't believe that. After all, everyone's entitled to be the hero of their own story. So I must be permitted to be the hero of mine, even though I am not. I am the villain. 